A continuación, para hablar de los TED de productos y soporte de reclamaciones, nos acompaña el doctor Benoit Rousseau. Uh, buenos días. And I apologize is the extent of my Spanish. Um, I could switch to French, but I think it's going to be very difficult for the translators, so I'm going to speak uh, stick with English. And uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank the organizing committee for inviting me here uh, to give a presentation. Uh, I feel very honored to come and share some of our knowledge uh, with you. Um, as you heard from my, I believe, I didn't understand exactly what was said about me, but from my background, uh, I am not a lawyer. Uh, I don't work in a uh, governmental organization. Um, our company actually is a private company that, is, that uh, has the scientific approach that uh, Leslie Fair very nicely uh, presented in a uh, presentation early on. And what I'm going to be um, talking with you today is some of the technical aspects of collecting data and analyzing results so that you can support a claim that you're making to, uh, to the consumer. So our company uh, collaborates extensively with, um, with attorneys. We work with uh, Christopher um, Cole of uh, Crow and Mooring. We work with uh, Larry Weinstein of Pascal Rose. Uh, we recently worked with uh, a firm in, in Canada, uh, Davis Ward, on a case that uh, where uh, the Rogers telecommunication company um, was being sued by the Canadian government on claims of drop calls. We all know, we all have uh, cell phones and there was a big case about false advertising about uh, drop calls rates. So, um, and uh, we, we have, we, we offer workshops actually, it's in the US and some of you might have seen some of the brochures we have outside, feel free to, to pick them up from a table uh, right outside the, the room. Um, the Chris actually is one of the speakers in our, um, in our workshops and uh, we have two and a half day workshops where we present, we have many lawyers, we have uh, uh, speakers from the national advertising divisions also come in and give their perspective on how to best uh, substantiate the claim. So today what I'm going to do is talk to you about product testing and, and claim support because when the company makes the claims, it needs to have some data to back it up. I mean, they could, they could just go out there, make a claim that we are best, the best cola in the planet, but the competitors most likely are not going to be very happy about it. So they might be challenged, and in order for them to, uh, to, become, to come out successful after the challenge, they need to have the correct type of data to support the claim. So in this presentation, uh, first of all, I will give you a bit of introduction about advertising claims and their substantiation and the need of science for claim support. And again, Leslie uh, put it very, very nicely early on, the importance is it's not just having a message that we're going to convey to the consumer. It's very important that we are able to substantiate the message, that we have actually the information to say, yes, we are actually uh, able to make that claim. Then I will get into uh, various aspects of data collection, because there are many ways of getting data to support a claim, but what would be the best way of doing it? Is there a best way? And uh, in there, we'll talk a bit about the ASTN guide, which is a guide which, uh, which is not a, a rule. And um, to illustrate also to you the importance of doing the testing properly, I will show you how easy it will be to show that your product is superior to a competitor just by the way you design the experiment. And the same way, if you do an experiment and you're not being very been very careful about controlling for bias, your competitor or uh, a government agency, agency can really uh, take you to your word and say, how can you prove that if you haven't considered all the biases that come in into the data collection? Then I will talk uh, briefly about a little bit of uh, data analysis. Like if you want to claim that your product is equivalent to a competitor, like a generic uh, drug that is uh, just as efficacious as a brand name, so equivalence testing, how can you do that? Talk about the ratio statements. The fact if you're saying, well, our product works 50% better than the competitor, how can you say 50% better? And so for that, you need to make sure that you have the right type of data, the right type of analysis as well. And then the last thing I'll talk about is the, it's a, the technical aspect of preference testing. If you give two beers, 
uh, I don't know the Colombian uh, brands, uh, but in the US we have Miller Light and Bud Light, for instance. And if you want to see if people have a preference between the two, you will present the two beers on a blind basis and ask them which, uh, which brand do you prefer. And very often you will have no preference options. And so the question is, how do you handle all that data? And then we have some conclusions. So, um, I'm a scientist. I'm going to try not to be too technical. Uh, so, if you don't understand everything I'm saying, it's okay. You know, it's what I want to share with you, some ideas. Just so that you're aware that there are, there are ways of making sure that you collect the right type of data and you uh, analyze the data properly. And um, if you're interested in learning more about those things, so I mentioned the workshop that we offer, um, you can also go on our website at www.ifpress.com and there you can actually get uh, some free publications on some of the topics that I'm going to cover here. Uh, we have technical reports, so uh, really if you're interested in these topics, I encourage you to visit the website. All right, so as an introduction, just some, some general ideas, and we know that advertising is a very powerful tool to reach the consumer. It's a very powerful tool to influence the consumer. And that's why we're all here today, is that we want to make sure that when we advertise a product, a performance of a product, we want to make sure that it's truthful and the consumer is not being misled by the, the message that we're putting out there. And uh, very often also you have competitive advertising where a competitor will bluntly uh, say, our product is better than yours. So you can do advertising, but there might be competitors' challenges. Very often, competitors will come to you and say, uh, no, you can't say that. We have our own data. Your product is not better than ours. Or your own product might be, uh, might be compared to your competitor, and it's the other way around. You would want to challenge your competitor to make sure that uh, they don't claim something that's not true. So, and I think that this, the reason of this conference and of the programs that have been going on for several years now is that can we actually put together some kind of rule book that someone who wants to make a claim can go get the book, read the various chapters, and say, okay, this is the way I want to do it. It would be very nice if we had a book like this. We'd make, well, maybe we wouldn't have any conferences anymore after that because everything would have been decided. Unfortunately, such a book would most likely never, uh, never exist because things change. You always have new knowledge, new information that allows you to make better claims, to actually maybe support a claim that you couldn't support before. So there is always more information coming in. There's no limit to the level of technical knowledge. And as we know, technology, and it's not just uh, physical technology, but any kind of things of understanding the, the human mind, psychology, we, we learn every day about new ways of measuring actually people's perceptions. So all those things can actually be brought in into a, a court case. The designs and analysis also are continually evolving. And uh, something that's very important to, um, to mention is that when you do product testing for claims, the, the, uh, the experimental approach is different from um, from, let's say, market research or qu uh, product development. In mar market research, you will have a very broad studies with lots of attributes, lots of uh, product characteristics that will be studied. But in claims, you have a very specific claims that you want. And you want to make sure that the design that you use is, is such that you're really focusing on that claim. And uh, I'll talk uh, about that a little bit further later on. Uh, claim support is a critical business activity for many consumer uh, product companies, and in, especially in the US, there are definitely some very aggressive competitors. Some of them, they just compare their products to all the competitors they can. And sometimes they go over, they don't, I don't know if we can su support it, but we're gonna do it. And they do as many as they can, and they win some, they lose some, they're being challenged, sometimes they need to remove the advertising, but that's the way they work. And so it's very important to understand the, uh, the underlying of product testing for claim support to make sure that you have the, the tools and uh, to, to substantiate the claim. And uh, finally, of course, this is very, why we are here as well. I, I basically talked about companies challenging each other. Uh, but of course, we're talking about the consumer. The consumer is going to get the advertising and then is going to 
trust the advertising, the message that's being conveyed. And that's why the FTC is there. That's why the, um, the NAD, the National Advertising Division, also plays a role to make sure that the message that's being conveyed to, uh, to the consumer is not misleading. So some examples of uh, competitive claims. So we have the performance of two vacuum cleaners, uh, the pickup, uh, how, how much two dusters would pick up the, um, uh, the dust, the various you know, malodor treatments for carpets, effectiveness with total salt treatment. So a competitor might say that our product is going to cure your, uh, your cold sore 20% faster than a competitor. This is a very strong claim. And it might be true, it might not be true. But if you want to make that claim, you need the data to support it. And that's something that uh, Leslie uh, shared with us before. Uh, the comparison of two early detection pregnancy kits, uh, home fa uh, fabric fresheners, the, the beers compared on color and taste, the drop call rates for two cell phone service providers. Uh, you say you want to say it's, uh, we all have cell phones, we know we don't want to have drop calls. So if actually someone can claim, hey, we have fewer drop calls than your main competitor, then people might be you know, enticed into switching or if they want to get to the service, to using that service versus, versus another one. Tooth whitening method, etc. I mean, you can imagine yeah. how many claims can be made on all kinds of consumer products. And so what we want to, to make sure is that <coughs> when we make a claim, we have the proper data to support it. And this is... Um, so this, this, these are some statements taken from... Uh, uh, from the, this reference from uh, um, Stephen Breyer, which is Associate uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, and it was a 2000, but there was the idea that we need science. That without science, we can't spend days, weeks, months arguing about something for which we don't have the, the, the data to, to back up. So what he was saying in the so 2000, that there is an increasingly important need for law to reflect sound science. And you remain optimistic about the likelihood that it will do so. And more and more science comes into the courtroom now. Uh, our president, Dr. Daniel Ennis, is called uh, very frequently as an expert witness to come and, and support a claim or, or, go as against, or go against a claim. We must build legal foundations that are sound in science as well as in law. And the reason is a simple one. The legal dispute before us increasingly involves the principle and tools of science. And it's very true, because consumer products, they're being perceived, they're being used by the consumer. So we have many ways of measuring what they actually perceive. And for that, we need to have the, pro the proper scientific tools. So this is a graph that's actually extracted from the uh, ASTM guide, which is the American Society of Testing and Materials. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. And they have uh, many different uh, groups, and one of them um, is about uh, a guide on claim support. So it's a guide. It doesn't say that you have to do it that way, but it, there are some general good practices to, uh, to follow. So the type of claims, so the, the way they're being uh, treated in that particular document, the first one is non-comparative, where what you, you're not compare, comparing your product to another one, like provides relief for hours. You know, that's some of the, uh, the cases that the, uh, Leslie mentioned earlier on were actually non-comparative. It's just something about product performance. Then there are another one, which is uh, other claims like, uh, that are comparative. And the first one is superiority, where a competitor would say, well, we are better. Our Coke is preferred over Pepsi. We have data that shows that. Imagine how powerful that would be. That would be this kind, of, this, this kind of ideas. You can also have counts, like two of th out of three professionals recommend it. Like two, four out of five dentists recommend a particular to toothpaste. And then you have the ratios, 80% more effective. All those messages are very, very powerful to reach the consumer. Then we have superiority and we have parity. So we don't really like parity because products will never be equal. They'll always be somewhat, a little bit different. They will never be identical. So we tend to talk about equivalence. So equivalence perform just as well as brand A. And this is very important when you have a uh, cheaper product that is just as effective as a more expensive product. And when you have the drugs 
for instance, uh, uh, drugs, we have the generic drugs versus brand names. And when they, you develop a generic, you have to show that you are as efficacious as the brand name. And so that's where equivalence co comes in, but how do you prove equivalence? And then you have unsurpassed, no, no one does it better. And that one actually is a claim in terms of getting the data, is the, easy, uh, the easiest to get. Because to be unsurpassed, you, just, you either need to be the same, equivalent, or better. Because here you really need to be better. You have to be better. Here you need to be equivalent. Here it's kind of the combination of the two. And actually, uh, unsurpassed, so we, uh, you know, no one does it better. Uh, it's just sometimes uh, uh, the type of claim that companies will make. But usually they prefer to be better than a competitor. All right, so this is the, the first two, uh, two points I wanted to mention. And now I'm going to get a little bit more into the details of uh, data collection and why we need to be so careful about collecting data or the way we collect the data. And also uh, to, to touch a little bit about data analysis. Okay, so th this is based on the ASTM guide. And again, it is a guide. Uh, it um, doesn't mean that you have to follow the, exactly what they recommend, but it's good to do. Right? So there, there, there have been many uh, groups that, are, that I've met that have discussed, you know, what can we recommend in terms of data collection. And so you could, when you do your, proper, your, your own, proper, um, your own uh, product testing, you might go another route, and it's fine. The thing you want to make sure that you can justify why you did it the way you did it. Something very important. Claims should precede testing. The planning for the claims. What are you going to claim about your product? Some companies, well, what they've done is that they will do testing, like market research, where they compare 15 of their products to their competitors, and then they have a set, let's say that it's some kind of yogurt, and they have a set of 50 attributes, and when they do the, all the analysis, they find out, oh, actually we are better than our main competitor on that particular attribute. Why don't you take this data and claim, now on national the, the television, because we have the data, we can go and claim it. And what happened? This is not the proper approach. There are many statistical aspects of it that will actually um, weaken the claim. So what can be done is using this first type of information, then use it and plan for proper claims testing. And then making sure you focus on that particular attribute between these two products. And that would be the type of data that would be the most, the most powerful really to, uh, uh, to hold in, in court. The wording of the claim determined the test to be conducted. So, I mean, you, you can imagine uh, also the target of the claim. You know, who are we going to test? If we have a claims like choosing mothers to choose X, the product X for the children, it is a statement about the mothers, not about the children. So it's not like, okay, we gave, you know, some soft drinks to 12 years old and we found that our product was preferred, preferred over our competitor. That's not what the claim is saying. This is really about the mothers. So we want to make sure that the proper, the proper group, group is being tested. There's a technical aspect also. Who do, you, uh, who do you have in your test? Do you just have users of the product? Or do you also have people who will be interested in testing the product? Because if you think in terms of the hybrid technology for a car, you have many people who own a hybrid already, but others that might be considering it. And actually, the advertising will have an influence on what they decide to buy. So you want to make sure you don't want to just focus on people who already own a hybrid, but people who actually are open to these ideas of, of using it. And there's also the, the aspect that if you do testing with just heavy users of a product, like let's say Miller Lite users, they have people who drink five or more Miller Lights per week, then your advertising will be for that particular group. You cannot just, you're going to have to say it specifically in your claim that this is like people who drink five or more Miller Light uh, per week will uh, actually prefer Miller Light over Bird Light, let's say. You, will, you cannot just generalize it to the whole population. If you want to generalize it to the whole population, you will make sure that you sample the whole population. So from the SCM, what they recommend, so the, uh, the US is obviously a, a large, um, large country. And so if you're going to have a national claim, you need to do testing in uh, at least four regions, which are the Northeast, 
the southeast, central, and then the west. And then they recommend also to have two markets per region. So it means that if you do a national claim, a national claim you'll go with a, a minimum of eight testing sites. And they even recommend more than one test site per city. So that's something that, that could be done. Uh, we've actually, personally, we haven't done it. Usually we go with eight sites. But that's something, again, this is something they recommend. Doesn't mean that you have to do it. You want to make sure that whatever sampling you're getting from your data is actually, uh, it's actually relevant for the claim that you make. <coughs> Selection of the product. So how do you select a product? If you say that you are the best, uh, the, the best strawberry flavored yogurt in America, Okay, in order to say that, you want to make sure that you have data to back it up. And then, so, in the, again, the ASTM, they recommend that the testing that you will have done will be between your product and, or at least that your product and the other product you tested represent at least 85% of the national market. So you might compare, if you have just very, two very strong brands, maybe the just the two brands are going to do it. Maybe you're going to have a set of seven or ten brands, which makes it much more difficult. So if you claim that you'll be the best, you want to make sure that you make the proper comparisons to, to support it. And uh, also, in the, if you have different brands, depending on the, uh, the geography, so various areas, you also need to have uh, testing, and so the various brands in the various uh, geographic areas. The competitive brands must compete in the same market segments. Um, there, there was another, uh, one, an advertisement of um, ocean spray, some kind of fruit juice, ocean spray, maybe cranberry juice, versus the V8 uh, vegetable juice. I don't know if you're familiar with that uh, with that brand. Uh, so, but so the, the ocean spray is a soft, not a soft drink, but a, a fruit drink. Versus V8 is more like ve a vegetable based um, beverage. So it's more, it has, it's much more nutritious, and maybe in terms of taste, it's not as good as a, a fruit juice. But it's, it's not there because of its taste. It's because of all the benefits that people will have by uh, consuming it. And in that particular ad, um, that they were showing a taste test between uh, V8 and Ocean Spray. And that the Ocean Spray really, and they had the data showing, yeah, Ocean Spray is preferred over V8. But they are not, not the same market. Because one is really for as a health benefit, while the other is more just a, a drink that you, you consume for, as a refreshment. So that's why you want to make sure that you have competitive brands. You, can, you may come up with a very strong message, but at the same time you want to make sure that the, comp the two comp competitive products compete in the same, uh, uh, the, the same market. So the forms, the way you do it, is it the frozen pizza versus fresh pizza? And uh, you want to make sure that if you use different forms, like instant X tastes as good as ready-made Y. So also it all depends. You need to be very, very specific based on the data that you have. Uh, that you collect, um, or the claim that you're going to be making. The, the, the last thing I'll talk about is data collection. Um, I don't know if some of you do focus groups, type of research. Focus groups will not be acceptable for claim support. It's not, you, you will need what we would call a quantitative type of data. So focus groups, that's something that can help you, maybe in terms of, um, uh, maybe in terms of putting together uh, your, your overall argument, but it's not going to be sufficient to support the claim. So you can do central location tests, you have consumers come in, they can come in and evaluate the products, you have home use tests, and then um, you have, so do present one product at a time, two products at a time. So destru destructive tests, it would be like uh, when someone takes a medication. If someone takes a medication, well, you, can have, you cannot have so the person takes a medication after that. So you're going to have to match groups of people who would be trying both medications, like the generic brand and uh, uh, the main brand. Uh, product hot peppers. If you have some products that are very, very fatiguing, you cannot make the comparison side by side. Or if you do tooth whitening, if you use a particular product to whiten your teeth, you cannot use a competitor to whiten. Or maybe you can do half, I don't know, maybe the top and bottom. I don't know what you could do. Maybe there's some clever way of doing it. It's probably not going to be very easy. So in this case, what you will have, you have match a group of consumers, making sure that uh, you can make comparisons on the efficacy of those uh, products. Then we have, so there will be, in here, consumers will just try one product. In here, they will try, let's say, the two products. Like when we do a, a home use test, when people, very often they will be given the one product, then they will return it, 
and then get the second product to make sure that we control that they don't they, they try it in the right order and that they don't uh, uh, mix them. Uh, body washes they cannot be tested at the same time, so it's going to be sequential monadic. Monadic, uh, but if you, are, you you can do direct comparisons for lots of food, if you have two pizzas or two beers. It's, it's very good to have direct comparison so people can really say which one they prefer between the two. And so there will be products with rapid sensory recovery. Okay, so again, I kind of went fast and it's more, it's more for you to become aware that there are some guides out there that are available to provide you some general guidance on how to do the, the, the product testing. And so that this is a, that the ASTM guide is actually a very useful tool to, uh, to start um, putting something together. So here I'm going to, to illustrate how a misleading result can be obtained just because of the way you actually ran the, the experiment. So in statistical terms, a statistic is biased if it does not estimate the population parameter accurately. So what we mean is that if we were to test all the consumers in the population, Maybe our product is preferred 60-40 over the competitor. This is the true value, 60-40. But we, do a, um, we run an experiment, and maybe it's not very well balanced, and maybe we find 80-20, or maybe we find 52-48. And even though the true value in the population, has, so that's what we're trying to estimate, depending on how we collect the data, we can get a biased estimate of that, uh, uh, of that preference in the population. So something that bias is, is very, very common, and maybe we don't realize it, but when you look at data as much as, as we do, you really see it very often. Position bias. If you give two beers, even if they're identical, people will tend to like the first one. There is a position bias. The first time people taste something, they like it, maybe they're happy to be here. They're getting free beers. They're, you know, they're gonna like it more than the second one. The resp uh, there is response bias. If you do any kind of uh, you know, cosmetic type of research, if you have a cream that's supposed to, uh, to decrease the appearance of wrinkles, just because you're giving the, the, the product to a consumer, there is a tendency to say, yes, you know, that's gonna do something. And so we see that very often, that the, the product, they will get 80%, 90%. That's what you see in advertising. People actually get those kind of percentages. 90% of women agree that it reduced their, their wrinkles. But what happened, it might be partly due to response bias, because just because they're in a test, they might have the tendency to, to say yes anyway. So in that case, what you would want to do, you would want to have some kind of control group, where you give a, the same product, but without the active ingredient. And you see that you know that product doesn't have any effect. You give it, you see, maybe they say already 75% say yes. That tells you that if you got 77% on the other ones, well, probably it's really just due to response bias. So this is, uh, this is, the response bias is very, very important to consider. Code, and I'm going to show you how that works. The design, the design you know, where, who your consumers are going to be. Make sure that they represent the, the population you're trying to reach with your advertisement. And whether bias occurs determine whether one needs a placebo or control product. You should be a product without the active ingredient. So here it is, that this is based on, on real data that we've analyzed. So there were two studies, we compared A versus B, C versus D. It was an eight CT test in the US. And so the way we identify the products is usually by three digit code. Okay, number 137 and 654, right? And uh, so each product is gonna have one of the, pro uh, the codes. And so, but what we did, is that in each study, because we were aware of those code bias, potential code biases, each product will appear on the low code, a small circle, and the high code, a uh, large circle. In the study one, we had A, so in four cities it was the, the small, the, the lower code, and the higher code in the other four cities. And then product B was the same, so, but that would be high versus low, and then low versus high. Okay, so we combined actually the, the high code and the low code. And for the second study, we did the same thing. When we compare C and D, we did the same thing. And so when we combined all the data together, we tested probably 400 consumers in, the, in this case, we found that overall, there was no preference. Like prefer A, no preference, prefer B, they were about the same. 
and process C prefer D. So overall, we say, well, actually, we cannot claim that B is, pre is preferred over A or that C is preferred over D. Really, we found something that were very equivalent here. So the claim really couldn't be made in terms of uh, better performance. But what we did, we said, OK, let's forget about product A and B. Just, let's just look at the high codes and then the low codes. And here's what we found. Because the products were so similar, we found now that people picked the low code as being preferred maybe 160 times, when actually it was 100, close to 185 times, when it was the high code. So it was the code actually was driving the preference. That people were not, they're not even aware of it, but they tend to pick the code that was uh, the bigger than the other one. And for the, the next study, we did uh, the same thing. We made those comparisons, and we found again that the low code had lower preference than the high code. And then if you combine them together, you see that it would be significant effects. So in this particular study, if we had not balanced the high code and the low code, we would have found that one product is preferred than the other. But that would have been misleading because it was driven really just by the codes themselves. Something we looked at also the position. So the same way people started sometimes with A, sometimes they started with B. So you know it was it was balanced between the two. So when people started with A, they tended to prefer A, just because it was first. Then when they started with B, they preferred B. And you have the same thing for C and D. So you see, it is a very strong effect, even though you wouldn't think about it up front. But to tell you the importance of planning for the testing properly. Because you can, at the same time, you can even play with it. You say, I think we're equivalent to our competitor, but I know a way of equivalence. So, okay, I, don't, I think I just lost about 90% of all the people in the audience right now. But, okay, it's, but the idea is that data, you have statistics. And that's where we're here, <laughs> because we have the expertise. That's why we collaborate so much with. Uh, uh, with various uh, attorneys on this, because we want to make sure that we have uh, an argument that is, you know, as strong as possible. Ratio and multiplicative claims. So again, another example I want to show. Compared to compared to a competitor, the copper treatment reduces malodor five times better. So five times better at reducing malodor. The tooth whitening is twice as effective. Maybe it works twice as fast, or it, you, your teeth are twice as white. Uh, the air freshener lasts 20% longer. Cleaning product performs up to 30% better. There's up to as well, which is a whole other story. We're not going to get into that now. So, but it is a very strong message, and it very resonates with consumers. Because consumers, there are so many product choices, so being able to tell them why you should pick one product A over product B is very helpful, in a way that's why, why advertising is there. That's why it's supposed to be helpful. We want to make sure, again, that actually it, it represents the actual uh, performance of the product. So the data that we need to support the ratio claim, and that's, uh, let's say we have an example with 100 consumers, uh, compare two carpet deodorizers. So you have a carpet, maybe you have a pet, maybe you have someone who smokes at home, you want to reduce the malodor. So compare two products, X and Y, and the way it would work, you present the control the carpet with just the malodor, then with the deodorizer X, and you ask, you compare the two, which one has more malodor? And then you will do the same thing, compare the control versus the deodorizer Y, and then based on some math and statistics behind it, you will come with that performance of X is 8.2 times the performance of Y. So you could say, well, we are eight times better. I mean, that's a very strong message. Think, can you do that? You cannot. Okay.